want to take a little different approach than some of the words we've heard um, and share my testimony of the last 10 years. Um, and I'll tell you as we go along why I'm taking a little different approach to what we're doing. Um, Ronald and I have spent a gillion nights in motels around the world together. Um, thankfully, we usually have two beds. <laughs> <laughs> Though that's not always the case. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but we were staying in a motel one time that the door emptied out into the parking lot like these, like this hotel, the motel does. And Ronald sleeps a little later in the morning. I wake up around 4.30 or 5, and if we don't have to go anywhere, he might sleep a little later than that. Um, just a little bit later than that. <laughs> so before I went to bed, I got my Bible and my journal and I some clean clothes and set them on the chair beside the bed so that when I woke up in the morning, I could get dressed and grab my books and go out and find a picnic table or somewhere. I had it all planned out and um, I woke up at 4.30, quarter to five and it was gully washer. It was just pouring down rain. Of course, I'm wide awake and dressed and there's nothing to do except sit in a dark room. Um, so I said, well, I'll be real spiritual and pray. Um, and I've had a prayer that I prayed for about 20 years. It's real simple. It said, Lord, Keep me useful, keep me alive and healthy as long as I'm useful. And when I'm no longer useful, kill me, I pray thee. Um, so I, I'm a guy, I want to always be useful. And I had prayed that prayer many times. And so I prayed it this time, and the Lord whispered in my ear and said, That's not a very good prayer. And my first thought was, I wish you had told me earlier. <laughs> rather than waiting 20 years to tell me. I said, why is this a good prayer? And he said, because I'm not concerned about your usefulness. I can use a jackass if I need to. Um, I'm concerned about you becoming what I created you to be. And as long as that process is going on, I'll keep you alive. And when you're all I intended you to be in this life, then it'll end. And so I've kind of tongue-in-cheek through, tongue through the years said, I'll get my three score and ten, and I'll be done. Now that I'm within a year of that, I wouldn't mind if you waited just a little bit longer. <laughs> that was easy to say at 50, and he just wanted to say at 69. <laughs> but... Uh, in 2012, I went and had my physical and found out that I had prostate cancer. I had never been in the hospital, never been sick, um, had slept five or six hours a night, and uh, I always had two full-time jobs. I pastored and ran and owned a business. Uh, a sizable business, you know, we were doing a million plus a year, uh, had multiple employees, and I pastored. And I, I always tell people I was never a part-time pastor or part-time businessman, I was full-time both. Um, I didn't fish or hunt or play golf, I worked and I pastored. Um, and I believed it was all spiritual. None, I didn't have secular employment and spiritual employment. I had the call of God in my life and it involved doing what, I, what was set before me. Amen. But I looked forward to the day when I would have less, fewer plates to spin, fewer things to juggle. And in 2007, I was given the opportunity to begin to work with International Outreach Ministries, and uh, I, I tell people I'm probably the only missions director um, 
on the planet who doesn't have a love for the nations. But I, <laughs> you can laugh at that. <laughs> but I've always had a love and a passion for those serving the nation. And that's what IOM is real good at, caring for those that are serving the nation. Um, so in 2016, Excuse me, 2012, I get the diagnosis that I have prostate cancer, and they want to do surgery. So they do surgery and take my prostate out, and evidently it was just in time. And prostate cancer, what I had read and been told, as long as it's contained within the prostate, it's a relatively easy way to treat, and but if it metastasize outside of the prostate, it's real serious. So um, this was at a high stage and they removed it and they brought me out of recovery and put me in the recovery room and my daughter was a ER nurse at another hospital from the one that I was work where I had been treated and she walks into the recovery room and looks at me and says, looks at my wife and says, why isn't daddy look better? How long has it been since you came out of surgery? And she said, it's been an hour or so. She said, there's something wrong. Uh, nurses, as many of you may know, nurses are kind of protective. Uh, it's, it's real uncalled that a nurse from one hospital will go into another hospital and try to nurse. Um, but she said, where is she? she asked my wife, where's dad's nurse? and she found him and he was actually a young man from the Philippines who didn't speak much English um, and uh, but she said there's something wrong with my dad and um, the nurse said no he's fine and my daughter looked at me again and um, called the charge nurse who walked in and looked at me and I immediately coded my blood pressure was 69 over 12 uh, and uh, I didn't know what that was at the time, but I found out later on it's dead. Um, <laughs> what I was told, so it was pretty low. Uh, and during those, during during that thirty minutes of tree trying to bring me back, um, I had two strokes. And um, so it was an eventful day. And uh, as uh, during the during the months of recovery from the strokes, the two strokes, I developed a slight tremor, and they thought it was this, that, and the other, and then finally diagnosed me with Parkinson's. Um, and uh, I had watched my dad wrestle with that disease for about 12 years, including the last four years of his life when he was 100% bedridden. And about 20% of Parkinson's patients develop Parkinson's dementia, which he did in his last couple of years. Um, could do nothing for himself. So I had this, this fear model, okay, uh, to look at, and I had um, the fact that um, there was no cure for Parkinson's, and um, I want to be careful because in my heart I, I, I knew the Word of God. I, I believe in healing. I have I haven't. Where's Clint? Is he gone? I haven't raised anyone from the dead, but I prayed for a lot of people. Uh, I probably have prayed for some to which they were after I got done praying for them. <laughs> but um, I, I, I've, I've seen God do supernatural stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember getting a call from my sister one night she was in the hospital and they had found a tumor on her uterus and it, it, it was critical that she have surgery. 
she, she went from the examining office straight to the hospital scheduled for surgery the next morning. The next morning. And she, they called me to actually, at 8.30 at night, to let me know they were in the hospital. She was gonna have surgery the next morning. And I was all ready for bed. I, I like to go to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock if I can. Um, and uh, the Lord told me to get up and go to the hospital and pray for her. And I said, it's 8.30, the hospital's closed. Lord, did you not know that? And, <laughs> But I could not go to sleep, so I got up and I went to the hospital and I prayed for her. And she knew instantly the tumor was gone. And she wouldn't let them operate the next morning without an x-ray. And the x-ray, they sent her home. Wow. Wow. Uh, we saw, the, I say that just to say, I believe in supernatural things happening instantly when we pray. Amen. Yeah. Okay, and I could give other examples, I won't take the time to do that. But I felt in this case, with the Parkinson's, that God wanted to do something different with me and with those around me through this process. And part of it was a real offensiveness on my part that people get mad at God when he doesn't do it they tell him to do. <laughs> How many of you know some guy, someone that, maybe they didn't get mad, but they got mad mad. Mm -hmm. um, and I was determined that I was gonna be one of those people who believed that God was involved in my life regardless of how the health outcome came. So we have been on a journey. Um, I got the diagnosis in 2014. Um, the the Parkinson diagnosis in 2014. Um, right at the time, I was fixing to step into the full-time role at IOM, the dream job that I had waited 36 years to have. Uh, and I get my Parkinson's diagnosis at the same time. <laughs> but I had a confidence that God had called me for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hosea talks about having your, your hollow ground plowed up. How many farm people in here? How many of you know what a chisel plow is? One or two of you know what a chisel plow is. When a farmer is prepping the soil, he'll, he'll generally use a disc, and a disc of these blades that he pulls behind the tractor, and it will it will break the soil up about six inches. But a chisel plow is a great big hook of a device. It goes on the back of the tractor, and if, if you see a tractor with a chisel plow behind it, then instead of 12 or 24 discs, it'll have three or maybe one or two of the chisels behind it. And the reason the farmer does that is over the couple over the years, what happened is about six inches below the disc plowing, the, the soil will develop what's called a hard pan. Mm -hmm. And if you took a shovel, you could dig down five or six inches and then you all of a sudden you did something. And they call for the chisel plow. The chisel plow is only hooked to big tractors. And it digs deep. And every few years, a farmer has to come in with a chisel plow and really plow deep. And I realized in my life, if it wasn't about me being useful, it was about me needing to be, to, to have my fallow ground overturned a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You don't wait in line to do this. You don't sign up to do it. You might sign others up. <laughs> it usually doesn't work. Uh, but God signed you up for that and put you through a process. Um, what I know is I will one day be 
as whole as you can be. But it may not be this side of eternity. It may be the other side. I'm, I'm at peace um, and I'm already um, I'm already beyond what they say you, you sh what you should be your functionability with Parkinson's should match reach out at about six to eight years and I'm in almost year 10 uh, and I'm in better shape than I've been ever uh, I never liked to work out uh, I, I tried running and the whole time I'm running I'm thinking I'm getting farther away from where I'd rather be <laughs> and, I got, and I got to get back. What, what kind of a deal is that? <laughs> but one of the things I found out is that the, the, right now the best medicine they have against Parkinson's is boxing and strenuous exercise. So I spend eight hours a week in a boxing ring and thankfully no one's hitting me, I'm just hitting things. Um, although I feel like someone's hitting me routinely. Uh, but it's made me, it's made me appreciate things in a way that I would have never appreciated in my life. Um, and it's given me grace for people who can step to here but can't quite step to here. The Lord knows, and my wife and I talk about the possibility that I won't see full healing from Parkinson's this side of eternity. But I might. But it doesn't matter. Because what God's doing in my heart, and it's in my heart. Um, so I wanted to quickly read a passage of scripture and give you three or four things that the Lord has kind of written on me as he's chisel plowed my life. Is that okay? Um, if you have your Bible, you can turn to a familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. This, this is so familiar, but follow along. Maybe you'll hear something you haven't heard quite that way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the sake of the joy that, set, that was said before him endured the cross disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God verse 7 drop down there endure trials for the sake of discipline I took an eraser and tried to just get rid of that line, uh, but it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go out. It is, it's, they use special ink. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not as children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not even more be willing to subject ourselves to the Father of Spirits? Be disciplined. He disciplines for our good in order that we may share His holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful. <coughs> Not sometimes seems painful. Always seems painful. But then there's going to be two... I'm not suggesting, and I don't want you to hear me saying we ought to put ourselves in a place where 
we make things you know, there's something I call the sit disease. It's self-induced turbulence. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Right, there, there's things that we do that bring stuff on ourselves. There, there's going to be two kinds of martyrs in heaven. All right? Those who died assaulting the gates of hell and those who stood up when they should have ducked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the latter. But I may have to be the former. Three or four habits that I've tried to incorporate in my life as I process being the victim of disease that I knew, that I knew nothing about until I was 56. Literally nothing about. Never been in the hospital, hardly ever got a cold. Never taken a flu shot. Never had a physical exam. Um, and then one little surgery that's supposed to last two hours <coughs> sets up a whole new career path. Huh. <coughs> I recommitted myself to be a lifelong student of God's Word. I just recommitted myself to being a lifelong student of God's Word. Um, I, I took steps to make sure that I would do that. For instance, every year I get another Bible, a new Bible. I do that because I underline in the Bible and I get it all underlined and then the next time I use it, I'm prone to look at the underline. And pay too much. Has anyone else done done that? Yeah. <laughs> a new Bible's twelve bucks. So I just I just get rid of the thing after a year and give me a new one. Why? Because I really committed myself to being a lifelong student. Um, here's here's where we need to move, brothers. There's two types of theology. There's theoretical theology. And there's life lived theology. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's the second that counts. Yeah, the devil don't care what you believe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he doesn't care what you believe. Yeah. He cares what you'll stake your life on. Yeah. Right. And if you'll live this book, it'll, it'll you know. Um, something else I've done as I try to choose positive, encourage, faith building, positive thinking, people to be around. Um, I, I know we have to interact with lost people, and I'm not suggesting that we don't, but we, we need to be careful that we don't spend a lot of time talking with people who are negative, politically and negative church-wise and negative about their family and they're anxious all the time and they're doubt-filled in their thinking and their speaking. Um, I want to be around people who encourage faith. Yeah. Uh, who, when I'm with them, I feel better yeah. about the future. Um, in, your eschatology matters. <laughs> what you what you believe about what's happening on the planet affects a lot of how you live your life. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord Amen. as the waters cover the sea. Yeah. That the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Yeah. Yeah. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's that's the kind of world I choose to live in. Hallelujah. Okay? I'll let someone else complain about the other stuff. And what determines that for me is, do I want to spend my time fretting about things that I have no control over? I mean... A tsunami in Bangladesh, I'm sure it's horrible. 
And I want to remember the brothers and sisters that are there and do it. But I can't do anything about it. You see the difference? Engage people that are positive and engage your thought life around things that you can do something about. If you can't do anything about it, may I suggest don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And that holds true for politics, or that holds yeah. true for religious stuff, or football games. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you have, if you, I, I've got two degrees from Mississippi State, all right? We know we're never going to be the champions of the world. <laughs> you know, you give us six, eight wins a year, that's a great season. I'll take it every time. Uh, and I'll let Florida State and Alabama worry about this dumb one. And the dogs. And the dogs. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens if you let your mind go. <laughs> Another habit, learn to pray with great expectation, yeah. right? Yeah. But not be discouraged if it doesn't arrive Lord. just like you like it. Yes. Pray with great expectation. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but don't don't wimp out if it doesn't arrive on a platter that happens. Right. Yeah. You know, we have at least one story in the Bible of praying and having to wait on the angels. Say, well, I've been here earlier, but I had to, I had a heavenly battle I had to engage in, waiting on Michael to get there. Uh, so you don't, you don't know when it will arrive. Come on, God. I mean, you don't know that. That's good. But you can pray with great faith knowing that if yeah. you're praying according to the word of God and in confidence, it will come. Yeah. You may see it in this life, you may not. Our, our lived theology says this life is but a whisper and a flash. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? We need to act like we believe that. Mm -hmm. Fourth one, then I'll pray for us. Practice compassionate, loving generosity. I'll tell you what generosity does. It says to you and your spirit, it don't belong to me. And most of us need a reminder that it's not our stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Generosity gets at that. Yeah. And we never know the trickle effect of generosity. Yeah. My wife and I, 30 years ago, arrived home from a trip, and there was stuck in our doorway an envelope. The envelope contained a letter to my wife from my boss and a $1,000 check made out to her. <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> and I've got the letter here that I could read to you. I won't take the time to, to read it. But in the essence, he says, you know what, Amy? You are a great wife and a great mother. And thank you for loaning us your husband to work. He's a fairly good employee. We'll keep him. Uh, but Take this $1,000 check. Don't spend it on the children. Don't spend it on Mike. Find something that's important to you and spend it on that. She found in Pennsylvania an Amish man who made tables and she wanted a table that would seat 24, have, have leaves in it to seat. And the table and chairs was a little over $1,000. And she took and ordered that table and bought that table. And that table's in our house today. And Michael can tell you, there is no telling how many hundreds of people have stood their feet mm -hmm. on that table. Amen. I've got young men sitting there 
who weren't even an idea when I married their parents. I didn't marry their parents, I did the wedding. <laughs> well, I just want to be clear, we're going out over the internet, don't want to start it. Uh, but a little trickle of generosity that bloomed out and here 30 years later, hundreds of people have been touched by that. Commit to living generous lives. Amen. Just just commit to living generous lives. And those are those are four habits that I'm trying to develop in right now and I trust that encourages you. Um, if if you'd like for me to pray uh, that God would ply you deeply why is that for an invitation? <laughs> I, don't even, I'm not, I wouldn't even answer that. I? <laughs> but I feel, I, I truly what I feel led. I feel like we all need God to help us embrace Amen. by faith that that hasn't arrived yet. <clears throat> and may not look like we think it's going to look. Amen. So if you'd like to pray, if you'll stand up, I'll pray again. Yep. Father, in Jesus' name, we say, take us, O God, and make us that that you had in mind from all eternity. When you knew us, Lord, in, in, in our mother's womb, before we had yet done anything good or evil, you had a plan and a purpose. I pray, Lord, you will help us to be the kind of vessels that don't resist your plow. We, we need the courage, Lord, to say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will help each of us to embrace nobly whatever you're doing in our lives. For those things that we've seen the results instantly, we're grateful and thankful. Lord, for those things that we've yet to even taste the outcome, we're grateful and thankful. We believe you love us more than we can comprehend. And that your, your care for us is from all eternity. So we can sit, standing in that, we can submit ourselves to you and say, have your will. In Jesus' name, amen.